everybody. Welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Ismet Himmet. Ismet is a lifelong martial artist and highly respected teacher with students in 20 countries around the world. He spent several years uh, tr training in China before returning to Germany and starting the first full-time live-in internal martial arts academy, Wudong Deutschland. Subsequently, he returned to China where he became the first foreigner to start his own Kung Fu school on Wudong. And since then, he's been training and teaching in his own style of Chinese boxing, weaponry, and philosophy. And we're here to talk to him today about all that and some more. Uh, Ismet, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to meet Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the pleasure is on my side. Thank you, William. So I guess uh, just for anybody who may not be familiar with you, can we start at the beginning on how I'll ask you how you got involved in martial arts to begin with? Yeah, like very simply said, it was um, when I was a child. When I was very young, like from five years old, I always played around and my uncles used to train karate, two of my uncles. So I started with them basically, but like um, continuous training started in 1985 when I was about eight years old. And um, of course, it was also the movies of Bruce Lee, you know back then right. and then um, my parents moved to Berlin from South Germany I was born in South Germany and here I went into Taekwondo for a while until I met my first uh, Sifu uh, Dragoslav Kostic in Berlin who um, like in 1991 I started training with him and he is uh, like his style basically is a soga kun it's a southern and northern style mix of eight animal style mm. but later he created his own chinese boxing basically out of this traditional styles he practiced and that is how i came into kung fu basically yeah from karate taekwondo also um like full contact fighting for a couple of years um during the 90s uh, in Taekwondo and kickboxing. And I stopped fighting in 98, 97, 98, because I started to earn money to save money for China, where I actually went in 2000, in the year of 2000, yeah. So you're still in your early 20s at that point. You um, Was your intention to, to go you you went to you ended up at Wudong. Was it your intention to travel to Wudong originally, or did you sort of find no. your way there? Of course, like I didn't know anything about Wudong. I was going for Shaolin. Right. I met a Shaolin monk in Berlin in 1998, and <laughs> asked him because I thought it's like in the movies, you know how how can I come to the temple? Right. But of course, it's it wasn't like that. So he um, at that time. Um, he was connected to Shide Chen, the late grandmaster who also is the author of the book, The 72 Skills of Shaolin, 36 yeah. Inner and 36 Outer Skills. Yeah. From the connection of him, I found um, three teachers I went to, and this was in northern China. And there it ended up that because there was a, a Qigong teacher, nobody knew. I, I didn't know who he is. He just taught us Qigong in the mornings. But um, then seeing what he's got and how he was like um, uh, pre, like pre-cultural revolution Wudang uh, disciple. Mm -hmm. So we found out more and more about this within a year. So it ended up that in 2001 with one um, writing of him, I, I went to Wudang Shan, wow. basically. This is uh, how I came to Wudang because um, Shaolin, of course, I still loved and I continued it basically, I mean, pra practicing the forms up to 2003 or something like this, 2004 mostly, but then it went only Wudang basically. Yeah. So from 2001, I went to Wudang Shan and um, looked first to the schools there and I decided to go to uh, Grandmaster Yoshuan's place um, 
later he moved to South Wudang. It's called Yinshan. It's another place still in Hubei province in China and um, where he is up to the, today. And six of his disciples, including me, we moved with him back then uh, to Southern. It's called Southern Wudang, but the mountains are called Yingshan. Yeah. And then, yeah, until 2005, end of 2005, I was, um, yeah, given a calligraphy where actually he, let's say, commands me <laughs> to to come to Europe and spread the, the style. Yeah. Hmm. So at the time that you were Wudong, there were not many foreigners there then, right? Um, I think there were also times more or less foreigners than my time. So when I arrived 2001, there were also not like academies around. No. There was there was only one, one academy at the mountain, and two wushu schools. Hmm. I mean, more modern wushu schools in the in the city down from the mountain. It's called Laoying City. Um, of course, back then, to my eye, the the movements of the wushu schools, the, I liked it more. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I had a writing from Grandmaster Long also. Um, who refers me to Grandmaster Yoshuende. So, but I didn't want to take this this letter out for, at first, at the beginning. So, because I want to check all the schools, I went up the mountain, I went to Grandmaster Jong Yun Long's place. It's another mm -hmm. lineage of my today's lineage. Yeah. Um, and what affected me most with my decision was when I was traveling, back then this was also no buses going up and no gate at the you know entrance of mount wudang like today it's now it's really more organized for the tourists mm -hmm. uh back then it was like you need to rent a car to go up and uh, or you walk up so when i went up with the van we we rented a van to go up to the mountain and we passed a place i didn't know it's yoshua in this place back then i didn't know um and i saw six people standing standing meditation basically um and one guy with a little beard were correcting them were like centimeter i just saw a four for a couple of seconds and then we went up yeah so up the mountains i don't know you've been to mount wudong or not but like when you go up it's about 45 minutes ride and then you change uh Today you change a bus, but back then we could go with the van up. Then we went to this one academy. We talked to one teacher of the academy. It was Jong Yun Long's academy back then. And then we um, looked around and then we went back. It was about two to three hours time. And when we came back, I saw the same people standing at the same spots. You're still so there. There I said, okay, this is where I want to go. Yeah. And then I found out this was Yushuan's place anyway. Yeah. So this was the way how I ended up going there. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And back then, as you say, um, there were not even in Laoying City today, there are supermarkets and everything, you know, streets and everything, but there were not even one asphalt street mm. when I was there, you know, like a dirt roads. Uh, proper, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> a lot of stories from that time, but we don't need to go too much into that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you you were there how many years before you you were there until two thousand and five, and yeah, like um, from two thousand one to November two thousand five, Mount Wudang and Yingshan, okay. both, up to two thousand three in Mount Wudang, but of course every year I came back to renew my visa back then yeah. it was not so easy to yeah. because not it was not a registered how to say like an academy where you can go to the government and say i'm in this academy i right. was just in yoshuan's place where it was basically a kind of a temple but um changed into a museum later hmm. with old buildings and only Chinese disciples were there back then. A part of in the, you know, um, special Taoist, you know, vacation days, there were other masters coming and visiting, exchanging. But basically, it was only his own people. Yeah. 
And so he wanted you to go back to Germany and 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 spread the the teachings that he'd given you, right? Uh, basically, what he in the calligraphy it says like, um, now your ways are open, as a sifu for Dogo means like Germany, um, and that was for me basically a sign. Uh, he didn't really talk to me and say you do this now, but right. he gave me this um, calligraphy. And this was also after the initiation into this lineage, um, Schönwupai, yeah. So when you returned to Germany, can you talk a little bit about how you formed uh, uh, Wudong Deutschland? Uh, what, yeah. was the, what, what was the martial arts uh, scene like in Berlin at that time? What was the, what was the prevailing martial arts? Right. Um, I, Germany is very slow, <laughs> you know, with everything. It's quality a lot with with the industry and everything, but also in the martial arts scene, it's very slow and the people need a lot of time to decide. Once they have their decision, they they really go the way with, with quality. Yeah, also in, in training. Uh, but at that time, as a Turkish roots guy born in Germany, now coming with Wudang, a Taoist art, people didn't really I mean most people ignored me and us mm -hmm. and I had one student uh, Dennis Lutke my first student basically he uh, I knew him before China also so because of the style what I practiced before I was also training with him before so he also visited me in China during the time when I was in China so he was the first guy said like, yeah, I mean, what can I do to learn? Mm -hmm. So back then he stayed sometimes even in my home, like from morning to evening training. Yeah, we went into parks and it was just like this kind of a training. Um, I must say one thing to that. When I was um, in this disciple ceremony in China in 2005, so after five years uh, being a student, when I was accepted as a disciple, uh, Grandmaster Yu Xuande, he, my wife was there. My wife, by the way, is also Chinese. So she was there and filming everything. Yeah. So she was standing on the side and the Taoist priests are there. And um, one of the main temples, Changchun temples, uh, abbot, um, uh, a lady nun was also there at that day. So he took one paper and one pen and he was drawing something. I didn't, nobody knew what. And then he drew at like a temple and in front of the temple, uh, like a river on the left and right sides from the temple, like hills. And the left side should be a little bit higher. The right side should be a little bit lower like this. He drew and then he showed it to me, he said, yeah, this is what you do. This is your temple. And I didn't exactly understand. So he said, yeah, this is how you should do it. This is the good feng shui mm -hmm. when you yeah. built your temple. And then out of nothing, my wife from the side says like, with which money, <laughs> you know, like right. how he should do that, you know, <laughs> like, um, she, like very, it was a very funny moment mm -hmm. because everything was serious and, you know, like, yeah. yeah. And then she like, how he should do that. And then, and that was so up to today, I still like uh, get touched by this. So Yoshende, he has uh, disciples also all over the world. And then he said to one of his disciples that he should call a businessman in Shanghai, who is also a Taoist disciple of Grand Master Yoshende. And he said like at any time up to a million dollar, he can invest for this. Wow. And then I thought I, I didn't understand it right. Yeah, but my wife again translated yeah. to me. And uh, by the time I spoke, of course, Chinese, but this yeah. I couldn't really believe. But then I thankfully like took it, but I, I refused the money. Okay. So I did I didn't use this mm -hmm. because my in my mind was back then even I mean, from my parents or from my relatives, I wouldn't take money for that because I wanted it, it grows by itself. Mm 
Right. And if it has a chance to grow, then it is the right thing. This is what I thought. Yeah. So, but he still gave me this, this possibility. He said at any time, and he gave it his number also. He said, but if you want to call this person, tell me first, I will speak to him first. So that was the thing, the possibility I had back then. But then when I came here, of course, I wanted to start f from scratch. And then we went into parks and training. And then people were curious, what is this, what you do? Uh, like mostly back then, only the fundamentals like standing, like hui chun chi gong and like this and some bufa gong, yeah, like step stepping training. It's mm -hmm. all meditative. And people start asking. So we it, it was a small group after a while. And then within a year, it was uh, possible that I opened this place, Wudang Deutschland, means um, like it was in 2007, in the summer 2007, in July, I remember exactly, with my wife together, we signed this contract of this place. And it was the first, to my knowledge, the first um, do, uh, lodging school for Kung Fu in Germany. I mean, people could come, live there, eat, train, and repeat. <laughs> yeah, right. this was the beginning. So within it, it took me a year to bring it together, and then we opened this place. And after opening this place, actually, it went really fast. Every day, new people came, and then, yeah, wow, it was cool. Yeah, yeah, it's been very successful. Mm -hmm. it's still successful. Still very successful. Uh, so I mean, yeah, we we try the best what we <laughs> yeah yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have a um. How how long did you how long did you uh, run that before you moved on to doing what you're doing now? How long did you uh, oversee Wudong Deutschland before you, you you turned it over to your students? Correct? Is that correct or no? Yes, yes. Um, in 2011, there was this idea of going to China and opening a school there. Why? Because <clears throat> between 2006 also up to 2011, 2010. We like people started coming from far. Also, it's not only locals. Right. Um, I must also say before I opened this place, um, the two brothers David and Norman Turek, I used to teach also in their school for a period of time. They gave me space. Um, David Turek, very well known actor today, action actor, and also, uh, yeah. Uh, plays in some movies with Jackie Chan already, and his brother Norman Turek. Uh, with him, basically later we went on to China. Um, so I started in their school. Later, the Loft Forty Six was there, like Wudang Deutschland. Mm -hmm. So during the time, we felt that like people from really from all over Europe are traveling just to train a month with us, and then go back, and then come back. So. Then my idea, main idea was, okay, they come to Berlin to practice this internal arts. Um, and not only Wudang internal, also other internal arts, what we were teaching, which are not from Wudang. So why they shouldn't go to the place where some of these arts are, are from? Right. So this was my idea. Of course, in Mount Wudang, there are also schools, but the our point was the principles. So th that was the difference to Wudang Pai. Um, like Wudang Pai and Wudang principles, these are not the same things. Wudang Pai is a, a tradition and with a lineage. So Wudang principles just takes these 10 ancestral principles and goes from this core out. So it can also variate, change, innovate, you know, with the training. It's, it's not very fixed and not very dogmatic. So this was what I wanted to bring to Wudang also. Because one of my teachers, uh, Tang Li Long, he's also a disciple of Grandmaster Yu Shuande. He was my main, t main teacher during my time in, in China. His teaching method was more or less principles. Mm. More or less. But he didn't name it. 
he didn't define it really, but it was more free. So um, that's why he's also very well known for his applications and his, um, you know, free flow and this. So therefore, this was the idea to make this happen in um, also in Mount Wudang. So I said that when the people want to come to Berlin, they can come to China and right. see the mountains there. And that was the idea. So and doing this also, I must say, I officially um, separated myself from the lineage uh, of Shen Wupai because now we started also teaching some MMA people coming to us want to learn about some p power development or like the like Fajin and all that and people from our like schools going into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and everything but using the Taoist principles so then it was not honest if I call it Wudang Pai. Yeah. So we said, okay, it's principles, but it's the internal principles going into those also other styles. Yeah. And that was the time, 2011, where I officially, uh, I mean, still, I still up to today meet my teachers and uh, visit my, you know, grandmaster. But uh, officially, the teaching is not Wudang Pai, it's Wudang principles. Yeah. At that time, there, there were a couple of students uh, long enough with me that they could lead the training in Berlin. And uh, one of them is Raphael Scullion, who basically I gave the school as a gift. Back then I said, if you want this, if you want to go with this, take it. And um, if you don't feel ready you can also talk to me but if i see you ready for that and then um yeah he appreciated that and took the uh, school and we went to china and our idea was like a time frame of seven years in china why seven years um we have an old saying in wudang shen wupai seven years yin before the young starts Okay. Like for seven years, only in, only taking, receiving, not, let's say, not asking questions. Yeah. So I said, like, within seven years, whoever comes to China, I'm willing to give everything what we have for the whole day and like whole day training and all the time. And uh, especially for long term students who want to become teachers. And we established this basically in 2018. I closed the school there and now we, we have more than, now by now more than 25 countries where this system yeah. is taught. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes on, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's one of the things that I've, I've uh, enjoyed about, you know, watching your videos and learning about you is, is what you were talking about earlier about how your teaching is based on principles. And right. you had a quote, um, try not to misquote you. You said uh, kung, kung fu is limited by nothing. And mm. you're talking about how it's it's not, mm. doesn't just have to be, you know, Chinese. It, 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 it's more so, about yeah. the, the principles right. of things. Right. And um, yeah, that, that, that really does make it limitless when you look at it in, in that, in that light. True. True. Right. 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 Absolutely. So, yeah. So what, what you're doing today, is it is it very different at all that what you did in the early days of uh, Wudong Deutschland? Is is, it, is there a difference in your training methodology or your teaching methodology? Mm, methodology is exactly the same because it was from the beginning that what bring people in a very safe way. I don't like to say fast, but relatively, if, if you compare... It is fast, yeah, but I don't like this term because I know there is no shortcuts in, in internal arts. But save from point A to point B. That's why the method is the same. But the styles I'm teaching, the things I'm teaching is more now. For example, the all the weaponry stuff, uh, like North Star weaponry, yeah. that is on since the last three years, is was never taught like that before also not in Wudang um, maybe in the past times but with all the protection gear and everything to really try out your stuff this I haven't learned it like this but I teach it like that yeah yeah and that is the difference but 
the Taiji is still the Taiji. The, the Liang Yichuan is still the Liang Yichuan in, in, in exactly the same manner as I was teaching it uh, back in 2006 and as I learned it also. Yeah. It, it's very systematic, I must say, and um, very step-by-step -step approach. It's, um, I mean, I had also students in my school in, in China short time students who come and in the first day we we show them some standing and structure and second day they come and of course yeah it's the same mm -hmm. thing and then they say yeah but this i did already yesterday yeah. <laughs> but it's not like that yeah it's we know that the until the end of your days you do the same things right to discover and that is this is the idea basically of our teaching also yeah do you, what do you find that students are looking for? Like, say, if you have a student that comes to you that's never done martial arts before. I know you train a right. lot of people who have an already have right. an extensive martial arts background, but yes. your students that mm -hmm. come to you that are new students that have never done martial arts, are they yeah. surprised when they start teaching with you by what it is that they have to um to go to go through? And are they are they do you find that they're glad to have that sort of a challenge ahead mm -hmm. of them? Are they look? Uh, I'm telling you, uh, William. Most surprised are the people who already have martial ah. arts background. The people who never trained martial arts, they come a little bit more open, I must mm. say. They come and, okay, if this is the way, I, I'm going to do it. Or if it's too boring to me, I don't do it. It's okay. Yeah, right. But people who have already martial arts, they now try to think with another logic what they had before. But I say, even to me, this logic, what we have is very um, paradox. It's, it's not, you cannot really explain to the guy why, for example, in Xing Yichuan standing San Tsai Zhuang, or like San Ti Zhuang, yeah. why this is so important also for fighting. You cannot really explain, like, it's difficult. You can demonstrate it. That's that works, and the people say, Ah, okay, that's why. But do I really need to do this for that? Yeah, you know, that's why people with martial arts background are more surprised with the training. Also, and this is what I really where I am surprised, also with internal martial arts background, they are also surprised with our teachings. I have students with over 30 years of Taiji experience, Taiji Chuan. And they are teachers for more than 10 years. And now they come to me and I say, okay, we start from standing. This is where we start. And then the next step is the bufa. Yeah, but no, I just wanted to learn this, this form from you. No, it's not. It right. doesn't work. I, I don't care how long you train martial arts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, and you, if you have the principles, it will be just easier for you. But the way with me, it's the same, you know, like uh, because some people say I don't have so much time, like I just have eight weeks. I say, OK, if you have the principles because you train martial arts before or internal martial arts, then you don't need to worry. It's not right. on me. Then you, it will be easier for you and faster. But the way I teach is always the way how the fundament is built. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you yeah. can't make any progress at all, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Right. You you also have a lot of uh, I noticed talented teachers that have been your students. Do you, do you have a special process for uh, teaching your teachers? Is there something that you uh, look for or concentrate on with them? Yes. I mean, it's not a secret. I can say it here. Um, teaching the teachers is why I teach students and if they are able to receive they will watch and they will see and they will learn from this and mostly i go with watching watching is a very very important thing of teaching like me as a teacher watching my students also the senior students um now it, it maybe goes into mytholo like um, mythologic 
teachings or um, because I believe or we believe in Taoism that the sight does something. That the look of a teacher does something. Uh, one time the uh, bee Taoist in the Wudang Mountains, it's a hermit in, in a cave living there since now, by now, more than more than 30 years by now, living in a cave. So he said to me one time, one sentence of a Sifu can um, save you 10 years of studying. One mm -hmm. sentence, what the Sifu says. But one look of a Sifu can save you a whole lifetime of studying. One look of a Sifu. So, um, I believe the look and what we see in that makes something. And this is how I teach also. It's not only, I mean, it's now, maybe it sounds funny. Yeah, well, do you just look to your, yes, I look to my students. And that is, I look with joy to my students. And that is basically what, um, because what I can see there, the growth internally, I see manifesting also year by year. I see that. So on the other way, if I don't look, I also don't see much development. I don't say now it's on me. Of course, it's always on the training of the student, always on the practice. Yeah. But um, the, the eyes are like a light putting on this practice. So the student somehow instinctively from the inside, like the light shows you the room, will know what to do. And this is uh, in, in our teachings, especially in Taoist Zheng Yi Pai, um, it's a, a one lineage of Taoism, Zheng Yi Pai mostly used like this, because Zheng Yi Pai, you are not in a temple. Chuan Zhen Pai, mostly you are a monk, you cannot marry, you don't um, eat meat, you don't drink wine. This is the, um, let's say, a couple of hundred years after Lao Tzu created religion of Taoism. Right. But the Lao Tzu's Taoism was not a religion. Right. And Zhuang Tzu also, mm. uh, he had a wife, yeah, he had a family and he, he lived from the joy of life also. It, it, the cultivation was different. So in this lineage of Jung Yi Pai, um, because the student can be somewhere in the world, you can teach him from here without talking to him. Yeah, it, this goes now into in, yeah into mystics and like this. But in in the kung fu, it's the same thing. Yeah, because teaching is teaching. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I I I'm not. Just for clarification, when you're talking about right. with like, like the look, right. see that you're teaching a student one on one. I know right. that sometimes when my teacher's teaching me, if he's looking at me, I can tell if I'm doing something wrong without even looking at him looking at me. Is is right. that sort right. of what you're talking about? This is sort of that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe on a more simple right. level, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but that's a very good example you gave just now. Yeah. Right. So uh, the uh, North Star Weaponry is one of your projects right. that's going on right now. Uh, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, just a little. Like it's based on Wudang sword fighting and Xuan Wugun. Xuan Wugun is also one of Wudang's stuff fighting methods. Hmm. Um, Xu Ben Shan is the last great grandmaster who. Uh, said or written down that who taught this system also. Um, it's a like we call it long pole, but most long pole people who have a like over two meters pole, they don't call this long pole. But basically, in this system, if the stuff is longer than your size, mm. then it's called long pole. If it's up to the eyebrow, it's called co pole like stuff. Yeah, so it's a gun. Gun, uh, the term of, of pole, but it is also spear. So within the system, there are spear techniques and staff techniques. Uh, and the sword fighting comes from Dan Pai Jian, Dan Jian and Qi Xing Jian. So seven star sword 
uh, until elix years old. Yeah. Um, for the higher, I mean, for the instructors, there's a third weapon. It's Zhu Wuyue, like deer horn knives, oh, yeah. which I didn't start teaching now, a part of one or two people. But um, this is for later. But the regular step-by-step -step teaching is sword and stuff. And in a way that you really try to use it in a fight. It's not going through applications and think, ah, okay, this is how it works because it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So it is having the protection gear on and trying if you can do this or not in under stress. And of course, at the beginning, you cannot. That's for yeah. everyone like this. But the drills make it that you can. But the drills must be correct. And what means correct to me is not the technically correct. It needs to be a hit needs to be a hit. So, or, 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 or like in the sword fight, a tsu or a ja means like a stabbing must be not stopped in front of the body. Yeah. So you must go for it to feel if you can really reach it or not. Yeah. If the uh, opponent doesn't want you to hit him. So, and yeah, this is basically no star weaponry. And uh, it's only two forms. And later with the deer horn knives, a third form for the deer horn knives, but one form sword, one form stuff. It's very simple. Of course, the fundamentals of that and the fundamentals of the stuff also. But uh, then it's all about how to apply this. Yeah. Do you teach that as part of your regular curriculum or is that more of a separate thing that you just concentrate on? I focus basically now on in Berlin here and uh, also online. Uh, mainly on that because it's it's a natural let's say path from the hand to the Chinese boxing more fighting to the weapons now and now I mean I teach since I was teaching Chinese Kung Fu before China also since 1999 yeah. but um, let's say from 2006 on only internal arts mainly and how many years now? I mean, now it's the time for the weapons, yeah, yeah for me. But um, a part of that, I have also one class in Berlin for pushing hands still, uh, fixed step and moving step pushing hands, like Tushu. This is mainly connected to our uh, snake and crane system of pushing hands of, of our Tai Chi Chuan, yeah. Right. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but one question that I wanted to ask you yeah. was... Uh, what do you see as the future of these arts in the world today? Like, you know, we, we've mm. got through a lot of changes with the pandemic and, you know, of course things are always right. changing, but they seem to right. be changing more and more rapidly. What do you see as the future of the internal martial arts? Yes. My belief is that there is a still one, let's say a wave coming. And after that people, will more and more go into intro martial arts. Why? Because as more, let's say, chaos happens outside, you will need to search balance inside. Yeah. And that's a very natural thing. Um, and also, I mean, promotion-wise, you don't need to do much because this will be very automatic. It's the people will search for themselves because the chaos is getting more outside. Yeah. And I don't talk only about the pandemics, also like wars and everything what goes around and the financial uh, financial crisis and everything. And it affects now basically global everywhere. One thing in one country, in a European country, can affect the whole world suddenly. Yeah. It's not like a couple of hundred years ago. So it's now it's different. So therefore, globally, I believe people will turn more into internal arts because the search will increase. The search for themselves because of what's happening outside. Yeah, And I believe into this principle of yin yang he tai ji dong jin ben zera. So this is our second um, ancestral principle of the 10 principles, basically. Yin and yang in harmony, that is tai ji. Movement and stillness, natural. So this means for me also in this 
political world now, like a situation where we are in, and everybody is in there, means when the yang increases, the yin will also increase. Right. So everything what happens outside, we will inside, will find or search for a balance for that. Yeah, that's that's what how I see the future of internal health. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think we're already kind of seeing seeing that people are definitely searching for something, and it just seems like a natural thing for them to find. Hopefully, they will find it. Mm -hmm. Well, we I greatly we appreciate you talking with me today. And yeah, hopefully we can do this again soon. Uh, can yeah. you tell people where they can find out more about your school and your teaching? The easiest way, um, yeah. The easiest way is uh, loft46.com, L-O-F-T 46.com, because this is a general page where, where people can find also my teachings, my seminars worldwide, and, and also the teachers who teach already in their places. That's the easiest way. There are also, of course, social media stuff, but that's the easiest way. Okay. Thank you, Ismet. I really appreciate you talking to me today.